our annual event of the Fintech LAC Network, the network of the LAC Fintech ecosystem. Before I introduce myself, in order to make sure we all understand each other, a few logistical instructions. Welcome everyone. Before I introduce myself and with the purpose that all of us here understand, let me give you some logistical instructions. Jaime, please, the logistical instructions. So, primero, vamos a tener interpretación. Yes. Simultaneous interpretation will be available. Choosing the language is very simple. At the bottom of your screen, you'll find a globe icon. All you need to do is click on it to choose your preferred language. I will allow a few seconds so you can adjust your settings. We will have simultaneous translation, interpretation. Choosing the language is very simple. At the bottom of your screen, you will find a globe icon. By clicking on it, you will choose the language of your preference. I will give you five seconds so you can adjust your preferences. Segundo, los invitamos a que Second, we'd like to invite you to be active by asking questions and making comments. Fintech Lag is all about you. You can send questions to the Q&A icon, which is also in the lower part of your screen. Third, the chat, which is on the right-hand side of your screens, will be using to send relevant information and links of use to everyone. Finally, we'd like to invite you to take part in the session starting today and which we'll be having until Thursday. On that day, we'll also be sending to our regulators, uh, securities exchanges and other participants a satisfaction survey. The idea being for our regulators and members of the committee to also take part in our sessions actively. Now, yes, I'll introduce myself. I'm Diego Herrera. I'm a lead specialist on financial markets at the Inter-American Development Bank. And I've had the joy of leading the efforts of FinTech Lag and will also be hosting the event over the course of these three days. We welcome you to the third meeting of the FinTech Lag 2022 network. In social media, you can use the hashtag FinTech Lag 2022. Our meeting is called a consolidated FinTech ecosystem towards recovery. As you will all know, FinTech Lag is a public-private dialogue which is ongoing and gathers 23 regulators and financial supervisors, 13 associations and fintech chambers, the Ibero-American Fintech Association banks and infrastructure um, of, and financial system infrastructure entities, among others. Our partners are decision makers in fintech LAC activities, our goal being to support governments, fintech platforms, and all those in the fintech ecosystem with a view to improving and enhancing innovation in the financial sector. For over eight years, we have been working actively on all fintech related matters, and today marks the conclusion of a full year's work. I would like to also express our gratitude to all those who've helped us get to this day with this quality of work. And therefore, I'd like to thank my team, the IDB team that have helped us put all of this together, and especially Ana Maria, Daniela, Mildred, Romina, Sahara, Silvana, Veronica, Gonzalo, Jaime. And please turn your cameras on, all of you, would like the whole region to see you and recognize you as the fintech leaders you are. So big thanks to you for all the support you've given us. And we hope to do a lot more going forward. Without further ado, we'll now move on to our inaugural panel. Today, headed by our Vice President for Sectors and Knowledge at the Inter-American Development Bank, the IDB. Benigno Lopez, who will 
be offering some welcoming remarks. Benigno, good morning. Thank you for being with us and welcome to FinTech Like everyone. Thank you very much, Diego. Warm greetings to everyone. Good morning. This is truly a very important event and a hallmark of the IDB group's activities. Over the course of these three days, we look forward to your active participation and we all look forward to learning. Having worked at the central bank and finance ministry in my country, I've experienced several transformations in the financial sector, and I can confidently say that fintechs open up unprecedented opportunities going forward. Technology should not increase gaps. On the contrary, it should become a tool for empowering the most vulnerable by offering greater access and more information and access to the financial system. We are amidst unprecedented transformation, probably thanks to FinTech. As an entity promoted de promoting development at the IDB, we want to ensure that financial innovation will also benefit our most vulnerable populations. Bearing that in mind, we are really excited to welcome you to the third meeting of the fintech like network a consolidated consolidated fintech ecosystem towards recovery this is an effort using the efforts of um, regional goods and technical cooperation resource at the bank putting them at the service of financial sector innovation at fintech like we are shaping the public policies to enable the digitalization of financial services in the lsa region generating institutional capacity knowledge and dialogue the work with uh, fintech lag fits very well into the bank's vision 2025 to achieve social and economic development in the lac region through fintech lag we are supporting financing opportunities for micro small and medium-sized enterprises the digital economy resource mobilization and gender policies which are all pillars of our vision I would like to highlight the achievements of our network in the last year and thank the executive committee for the major boost it has given the activity. I would like to recognize our five representatives at the IDB, the Securities Commission of Argentina, uh, which holds a chair, the Colombian organization, the Dominican Republic's organization, the Panamanian one, and everyone else for their decisions and initiatives. I would like to highlight some important public policy achievements. First, we were very pleased to support the Chilean government in the first open finance project in July 2021. And we wish the country all the best with this regulation that will spearhead even further change in the region. And we also supported Honduras with crowdfunding and payment system projects. During the last year, we supported Central America directly in order for Costa Rica, El Salvador, and the Dominican Republic to open their financial innovation hubs. We consider it important to uh, create institutional capacity in the region. Financial innovation hubs strengthen financial regulators in order to allow uh, innovators and fintechs to come into contact and engage in open and informal dialogue on their products, services, or activities. This is win-win. The sector has access to authorities through a regulated digital window. In turn, regulators through dialogue will be able to build the paths to implement innovations in the financial system. I would also like to stress that in all cases, the hub was a decision made by the country itself. For example, in the Dominican Republic, a, an unprecedented effort was undertaken, uh, led by the central bank, also with four superintendents' offices, banks, uh, securities, pensions, and insurance. Um, institutional capacity, we have been developing also through academia, supporting uh, training for over 120 civil servants um, at financial authorities in 18 countries, working with uh, Cambridge University online and uh, regarding fintech regulations. Our authorities are no longer strangers to blockchain or innovations like regulatory sandboxes or segments like open finance, crowdfunding, digital payments, among others. It is also worth uh, noting 
the generation of knowledge and the guidelines we provide for the development of public policies in the region. We support countries in the Pacific Alliance, uh, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru, to identify their fintech ecosystem to make uh, public policy decisions in keeping with the current times. We also um, issued publications on digital onboarding, innovation hubs, regulatory sandboxes, and the deconstruction of our crowdfunding ecosystem with Cambridge University, with which we have forged a fruitful alliance. Actually, I am pleased to share with you that we have today published our uh, flagship study, FinTech in Latin America, a consolidated ecosystem towards recovery, which we prepared with uh, IDB Invest Cooperation and the support of Finovista, another partner of the bank. For the first time, we have included a summary of uh, regulations and public policies in the region, along with an interactive map that will be available to the whole region benefiting the sector, investors, and public policymakers. There are several interesting findings that I would like to share with you. Um, this is a preview. The fintech ecosystem in the LSA region has increased 112% since in 2018, we published along with Finovista, the last edition of our analysis uh, with regard to the sector. Again, it's doubled. Our region went from 1,000 166 platforms to 2,482 in 2021. Brazil continues to lead in terms of number of platforms in the region with over one third of the total figure, followed by Mexico at 21, Colombia at 11, Argentina at 11, and Chile at 7%. With our support, we do believe that the number of platforms and opportunities for inclusion arising in different sectors may increase in other countries around the region. The most important segment in terms of the number of platforms is still payments driven by recent regulatory developments in Brazil, in Brazil and Mexico and um, extends to over one quarter of the total platforms. But the digital loans platforms at 19% and crowdfunding at 5.5% are gaining ground. There's a lot more in a document regarding gender, financial inclusion and regulation. With this, I would like to formally inaugurate this wonderful week, these great days we have ahead with you as part of an ongoing learning process. So our event is formally opened and congratulations to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benigno. So moving on now with our event, we'd like to give the floor to the President of the Executive Committee of Fintech Lag for 2021-2022, Dr. Martin Reilinger, Breitlinger, representative of the Argentine Securities Commission. Hello, Diego. Thank you very much. Warm greetings to all participants. I would especially like to thank the IDB for offering this amazing opportunity that FinTech lag is that has taught us so much and allowed us to make so much progress in interacting between regulators, chambers, and the private sector. I would like to take the opportunity to highlight two things that may seem evident, but uh, it's never too much to mention them. The importance of uh, the FinTech ecosystem and the knowledge economy for our region. And secondly, the complex challenges for regulators to address this topic effectively. Generally speaking, there's consensus as to the fact that one of the key roles of the fintech industry is to contribute to financial inclusion. This becomes all the more crucial in a region where financial um, education levels are low, there are major economic gaps across countries, and there is also um, significant economic and geographic um, gaps. The idea is to reach areas that were not able to access finance. The idea is to offer opportunities for investment, saving, and for entrepreneurship in a safe and transparent manner. After chairing the Executive Committee of Fintech Lag -like for over a year and after having worked intensively on our agenda locally, I believe if we undertake efforts in the right way, fintech can be a major development driver for the region. We have an industry that can create 
well-paid quality jobs. We see growth in direct and indirect jobs and competition to provide more and better services to financial consumers. In other words, we face a sector, we're dealing with a sector that not only boosts other sectors in the economy, but which is also strategic in itself because it can create jobs, develop technology, and foster competition among participating businesses. The challenge, of course, is to boost the naturally positive um, opportunities of the sector in our region's economies. And this challenge is linked to the role of public policies. We must put together a work agenda to build a regulatory framework that fosters financial innovation and mitigates risks. Let's not forget that regulators have as part of the main missions, the protection of investors and financial consumers. This was already a challenge for traditional financial services, all the more so now with all the technologies and business models that have prospered, which uh, are more and more blended. Payment services, loans, uh, credit, decentralized finance, among others. Some of these technologies are also a cross-border, transnational, uh, which creates flows and uh, there's a colossal task ahead, which is of vital importance to the region. From my vantage point, public policymakers must start by learning and understanding in order to then regulate. If we consider fintech a disruptive phenomenon that changes financial services, we must definitely uh, improve the knowledge and expertise of those working on regulation so as to have officials who are better positioned to foster innovation. This is a key pillar. Traditionally, the industry was characterized by being dynamic and fast changing. Technologies change and evolve and business models change and improve accordingly. Certain Regulations that may be good for a particular business model at one point in time may not be as good at a different point in time. We need flexibility to ensure innovation and competition while protecting investors from systemic risks and fraud. In some, fintech, in addition to promoting financial innovation, can be a partner across the board for development in the LAC region. For this, we need the right regulation for a complex dynamic sector that should develop without neglecting the quality and transparency of the financial services offered. Fintech lag has proven to be a strategic regional public good to understand these concepts and deal with them as responsibly and seriously as needed. This requires ongoing support to develop better regulations. Also, this has offered financial resources to study the state of regulation and of the systems in the regions, crowdfunding, innovative financing, open innovation, innovation hubs, the regulatory sandbox are some of the studies we have undertaken over the course of the last two years. Also understanding experiences of other regulators has been key to launch the uh, Argentine Securities Commission uh, hub, which is an innovation opportunity to learn about business models, technological trends, and to help innovators uh, learn about our regulatory perspectives. Finally, let me say I've been proud to chair the executive committee of FinTech LAC in 2021, and I thank all members of the committee, Diego and the IDB staff. I would like to invite you to attend all three days of our event. The contents will prove very useful and reflect the state of the industry. And we have high quality presenters. Thank you very much, everyone. Diego, thank you, Diego. And thank you also very much for uh, recognizing our work. And of course, your work in the executive committee has been key. So we'll listen to Angel and then we'll move on to today's presentation. So Angel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and welcome. Hello, Diego. Good morning. Good morning to you and everyone. I'd like to thank the IDB for these uh, three years of fintech like work. We have seen high quality deliverables and a lot of commitment and enthusiasm in the team. I hope we will be able to come together in person again. Could we ask you to get a little closer to the mic because we can't hear you very well and the interpreters can't hear you very well either. 
Is that any better? Go ahead, please. I was just expressing my appreciation to IDB for these three years of FinTech lag. We've been building a buoyant ecosystem. And um, I hope we'll soon be able to meet in person again. And we hope to continue to enhance links between the public and private sectors going forward for the benefit of the region. As Benigno and Martin have said, the fintech ecosystem is of great importance. And I would like to uh, make a couple of extra comments. One important thing to mention is the importance of public policy in the region. And in this regard, we shouldn't allow opportunistic players to undermine the major footprint of uh, competitiveness and financial inclusion we are building. There is great concern among our fintech systems in the region. In addition to the growth of fintech companies in Latin America, we also see speculators and fraudsters who are actually taking advantage of the good faith of many people, and this creates harm to the population. But of course, we should always focus on the right regulation, which is put in place timely and is technologically neutral. Regulation offers more certainty to the fintech ecosystem and to investors, as well as to all users, including the banking and financial services provided by the system. The idea being to leave out these shady dealers or fintech fraudsters who could actually end up marring the good work we're doing as regards this regional public good. So we shouldn't stop and continue to uh, highlight the importance of open finance, making the opportunities available, working on mandatory regulation of open finance. And in fact, some countries have already done so, this so on a voluntary basis. It is very important to make sure that the providers contribute data to the open finance system being built. So we invite us all to take that step to be able to actually realize the vision. Open finance is the greatest of opportunities and uh, we need appropriate regulation. Another message is we need to raise the visibility of fintech as not just a financial instrument, but a, an engine for the growth of our economies. The banked population has grown about 24% during the pandemic, according to recent estimates. But it is also true that in addition to this financial inclusion drive, the region has received $15 billion in capital investment, as far as these businesses are concerned, which accounted for 7% of fintech investment globally. And investors expect to see Latin America grow even further and account for 15% of global fintech share if it continues to advance on public policies. And I mentioned this so that we see fintech as a way to grow the economy. It can become an extra engine for us to diversify our export base and for us 
to no longer be reliant on natural resources and to be able to dream of exporting financial services. This is very important as these platforms can cross borders and go all the way to Europe, Asia, and others. So this is a beacon of hope for us to have yet another economic driver. Countries like Singapore, who are already joining initiatives like the Pacific Alliance are net exporters of financial services and definitely Latin American talent, talent is already there and should be tapped into. So having shared these three main thoughts with you, I'd like to thank uh, for the great work that FinTech Lag has done uh, with all the businesses that also boost the ecosystem. I would like to thank all of the regions associations for the commitment to continue boosting innovation, competition and financial inclusion in the region. Thank you very much for joining us. And let's all be part of this great event that will tell us which way technological finance is heading in the region. Thank you very much. And I give the floor back to you. Thank you very much, Angel. I think the messages are clear and private sector participation in FinTech lack is key. This is why we created a public-private dialogue and decision makers are the members of the executive committee. So we'll go straight to our presentations and we have four speakers from the regulatory and supervision uh, entities and the uh, Ibero-American office. Um, let's move on to our first slide. Basically, what we'll have here today is first a bird's eye view of what was done in the previous year at FinTech Lag. As Benigno said, we had a successful year. Our idea is to build the future, and this we are doing on the basis of a mindset that we'll share with you now. The logic we have been pursuing has been based on starting off with the creation of knowledge products and public policies in writing. In other words, what we intend to then implement. So throughout this and other presentations, you will see QR codes. So have your phones ready to use the QR codes to download relevant information. And as far as FinTech Lack is concerned, we have been creating knowledge. And on the basis of knowledge, we have been creating institutional capacity and putting in place uh, public policies, which is what we want to have. We have trained more than uh, 100 uh, civil servants uh, throughout the region directly on public policy matters, regulation, and so forth. We have supported the um, overhaul of four regulations or issuance of four regulations in the region. So as I was saying, knowledge is very important last year. We published on digital onboarding uh, jurisdictional sandboxes, uh, sandboxes and uh, innovation hubs, regulatory innovations. We also provided uh, support with the uh, Pacific Alliance in Chile. Now this year, as we've already mentioned, as the vice president of the IDB sectors uh, said, we are forging ahead with a publication that's going to be issued today and we will leave this slide up later on with the qr code for you to download this presentation andres will be telling us about this at on the next uh, presentation essentially what we're talking about is a complete uh, cycle of publications for this year crowdfunding regulation 
We work with a friend uh, dear to us, Rocia Robles. Uh, we will be presenting a document on open finance as well with the uh, participation of F Data and other partners within the region, another on crypto assets that we will be sharing with you. This contains the crypto asset ecosystem in the region, as well as payments for the Pacific Alliance and uh, many other ones that we are still hammering out with the region and with the uh, FinTech partners. This enables us to generate institutional capacity. In fact, we have a partner in the University of Cambridge, and the result is that we have more than 100 uh, regional regulators that have been trained through this training process. Now, you can see the breakdown by gender, gender distribution among the trainers. It's pretty much 50-50 between men and women. We have trained people from 15 different countries throughout the region. Obviously, some countries have sent more trainees than others, and we do encourage you to continue to do so. And what the IDP has been doing is financing the half or 50% of uh, this with CFTRI, this training program with the University of Cambridge, and we have been able to train all these people in technology and the knowledge that, that they need to tackle the um, fintech development. So in practice, what we have done is work internally within the bank and an operation that's uh, headed up by Sandra Reyes, Alejandro and uh, others, along with the uh, housing and uh, Colombian authorities, the financial superintendency of that country to uh, put into effect the first blockchain pilot project and we are using this regulatory sandbox in this uh, first pilot project it's uh, been quite interesting it's uh, been working well we will report to you how it's going we do see that that uh, part of the future of capital markets is going to have to uh, take that approach so as you see Everything that we have written on, we put into practice that uh, we have uh, written on crowdfunding, on regulatory sound sandboxes, as well as uh, open finance and everything we have written on, we have put into practice. And uh, there's no shortage of examples. The most recent one is the um, Chilean Bill of Law on fintech, and we supported with uh, assistance for consultancy services. This is a very important part of what supervisors and regulators have to do to understand what the business models are, what exists in each one of our countries. Furthermore, we have been working regularly throughout Central America as well. We set up these innovation hubs starting with the one in Costa Rica. Also, the Dominican Republic um, has undergone some innovations. And we're going to hear from the Central Bank uh, of that country about the experience there. This has been a seminal experience to generate a dialogue between the innovators and the public sector. It's key to have an innovation hub, especially when ecosystems are just um, starting. Hopefully we'll be able to work on a similar topic set with the Pacific Alliance. Now, by way of concluding my comments right now, and to summarize what we've been doing at FinTech Lab has been to put into practice what we do, again, what we write about, we put into practice, we have demonstrable uh, evidence of that throughout the region in public policy that actually works for innovation with innovation. This is what we're going to be doing for the next three days. We're going to start with a great panel, Andres Fontao, Gonzalo Raos, Robert Wardrop, Tanya Ziegler, about uh, building the fintech infrastructure 
and also what the benefits of that are. Tanya and Robert will be talking about that. Now, day two of our event, we are going to hear a from a keynote speaker from Brazil who will talk about picks and Hema Sacristan, also our CIO of IDB Invest, focused on the topic of payments, the importance of payments, financial inclusion. Then there will be a panel that will talk about open finance. DeFi, headed up by Bruno Dinis from the UK with the regulator as well, uh, Rodrigo Tumayan on open banking, Mauricio Tovar from Tropicus, a DeFi business that is changing how business is done throughout the region. Then a dialogue on bank, central bank digital currency, first from John Frost from the International Settlement Bank in Basel, who will tell us about the CBDCs. We'll also hear from Juan Ketcherer, and then we'll have a very interesting panel. The Central uh, Bank of the Dominican Republic uh, will be a part of that panel discussion. The superintendent of, the, of Colombia, the financial superintendency, Diego Perez, AB Fintech of Brazil, representing his own fintech to talk about how fintechs benefit uh, from the regulatory sandbox. Our chief economist at the IDB, Eric Parado, is going to moderate that panel. So this will give you a, a future outlook on uh, fintech in the region. So Jaime, please. Without further ado, well, before that, last uh, but not least, we are going to close this section. Now, regulators and supervisors, please uh, sign up on the Zoom link. That's just for the fintech, uh, fintech uh, regulators and supervisors. Uh, for us to program what is coming up next year. Now, as I was saying, please join our FinTech LAC network. Just click on this QR code and follow us. You will find information about everything we've been doing throughout the year, all the different publications uh, issued, events held, just to be mindful of this. Uh, in September this year, we're going to be talking about crypto or launching event, launching a document in an event on crypto assets. Now, let's uh, proceed with our event. Don't forget, you'll be able to tell us what you think about this event in a survey that's open to the audience, your opinion matters. We're pleased to get your feedback and we hope that you find this uh, presentation to be very useful to you. We have so much to share. So on this slide on the bottom right, you see the QR code. If you would like to download this document, 220 pages with all of the information on the regional fintech ecosystem with a we're going to hear a summary um, in short about what this document contains please uh, download it it's very worthwhile read it this is very important for um the academic sector for financiers uh, please download this uh, our publication The link will be put in the chat as well. Click on that. I encourage you to read it, provide us feedback through our email. Jaime, please. 
Y con esto, entonces, los dejo. Esta es nuestra publicación. Los dejo con... Well, that on our publication. So now, uh, Andrés Montao from Finovista, with whom, a partner of ours, with whom we've been uh, lucky to work with. We'll learn about how the ecosystem has grown, how it's evolving. And I give the floor now to Andres Fontao. Please proceed with your presentation. Tell us what has uh, transpired over the last three years in the fintech ecosystem. Welcome you to fintech 2022. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Diego. It's a pleasure to be here with you at these uh, conferences, which are so important for the development and uh, for the development of fintech throughout Latin America. I would like to start by congratulating Diego Juan Antonio and the whole IDB team for the effort put forward over the last couple of years in the region to create and to manage fintech lack. We think that this platform is necessary as a regional organization to continue to foster dialogue and innovation in the financial services market throughout the region to bring together the different stakeholders and agents and to ensure their collaboration and building this ecosystem. Much of the data that we will see today, many of the milestones that we have uh, reached over the last uh, year, as Diego said, are the result of this effort and this collaborative platform. So congratulations to everyone who has had a hand in FinTech Lack. Now, for those of us who are uh, fully invested in this uh, system, in our case, uh, since 2012 at Finovista, in which you've been engaged in this, we think that the last two years, two or three years, have been marked by a, a swift growth and consolidation of FinTech in Latin America, as you can appreciate here on the screen. And you'll read more details in the report that's being released today. We're talking about 2,500 fintechs that have emerged and are currently operating in Latin America. That's a 300% growth since 2017. In 2017, there were 700 fintechs, and now we're at 2,500 nearly. Now, this growth over the last couple of years has been backed not just or or affected not only by COVID and the lockdown that uh, COVID ushered in, but a change in consumers' habits. There's been a greater demand uh, for digital financial services with uh, an increase in uh, risk capital investment and greater development of uh, favorable frameworks in some of the countries in our region. Regulation and capital are two factors which are driving and empowering innovation of a fintech throughout Latin America. Next slide. As you can appreciate here in the region, there's a strong concentration of fintechs in the five main countries, Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, Chile, which uh, account for 51% of fintechs throughout the region. If we were to add again to that original list, um, Colombia, Argentina, Chile, we're talking about five countries which account for 81% of fintechs which currently operate in Latin America. Let's not overlook the rest of the region, however, in which there is a, a group of countries with an emerging fintech sector which are showing a uh, Significant growth rates, case in point, is the Dominican Republic with 129% uh, growth over the last couple of years, or Peru and Costa Rica with 70% um, growth rate, Uruguay 
under 50 percent but still a part of the surge in growth showing that these are the countries that will uh, continue to grow their fintech sector relative to other countries of the region now seen uh, by segment uh, payments and lending to consumers and uh, small and mid-sized companies these are the segments that stand out in latin america and that stands to reason they represent the basic financial services that the vast majority of the population requires smes and consumers and we've seen that that sector has been uh, boosted even more owing to the covid related lockdown a greater there's been a greater demand for digital financial services now the third most important sector is etfi as we call it these are technology companies which are now joining financial institutions and this has been bolstered of late these are the incumbents uh, who have been bolstering their digital offering as their clients their clients are also demanding ever more such services next slide emerging sectors digital banking which has grown by 57 percent in the last couple of years there have been a couple of uh, banks that have uh, really grown digital banks uh, considerably these are incumbents as well as fintechs neki in colombia Banco in Mexico, just by way of a couple of examples. ETFI, as I just said, has uh, grown by 50% in the last couple of years, given all the behavioral changes by banks' clients that now demand digital services, making it necessary for banks to enhance the digital solutions and proposals they offer their clients lending and payments are two sectors that are showing strong growth rates also owing to the pandemic but there are other sectors insurance which over the last couple of years has grown at a fast clip and this is a sector that had whose uh, digital transformation had fallen behind. And uh, now they're seizing the opportunity uh, to see this as the right time to come up to speed and digitize. They're about four or five years behind the banking sector's dig um, digitalization process. And uh, so now there's a surge to catch up. Next slide. Now to talk about one of the factors that I had mentioned in the beginning that has been a driving factor for innovation and consolidation of the industry is uh, access to capital, capital that is empowering the development of fintech in these uh, fintech startups. This enables them to validate and scale up their business models. As you all know, 2021 was a uh, banner year for risk capital investment in Latin America, 15 billion US dollars uh, worth, nearly 40% of that capital was for fintechs. This also validates the fact that this is a real opportunity and there are investors out there willing to put their money into this uh, throw the necessary capital into this uh, which is 
a means whereby these fintech uh, fintech startups can validate their business models and scale them up. Also, the last couple of years, we've seen from the standpoint of investment, capital risk funds that are renowned, well known, uh, coming into the sector. Anderson Horowitz, Lightspeed, Excel, General Atlantic, other funds that have emerged with the specific purpose of investing in fintech and over the last year have created specific funds to support fintech development throughout the region, Clock Tower funds of a global scale now being poured into fintech in the region. Over the last couple of years also, 2021, namely, has been a year marked with by different uh, mergers and acquisitions in the fintech world without to focus on any particular one. What we see is a trend, and you can see that this continues in 2022. Fintechs, be they in banking or being purchased by uh, banks or by other fintech companies to consolidate uh, a position in the market and banks that are now being bought up by fintechs. In Mexico, we see a case in point in which Nubank purchased a bank and another one did the same. Without taking too much time, I would like to underscore a few of these uh, instances. The case of Nubank last year that went public with a valuation of $40 billion. Voila, are two examples of digital banks that last year raised considerable amount of capital Again, again, New Bank uh, went public on the New York Stock Exchange with a valuation of 41 billion. Voila, 2.45 billion dollar valuation. Bitso, a fintech uh, operation within the crypto space, raised 250 million dollars under with its uh, latest round of Series C international funds that took part in that round. And again, uh, with a valuation of 2.2 billion. Flink, the Mexican startup, also operating in wealth management. will be going public. It has raised $57 million. The valuation hasn't been disclosed yet, but uh, rumors say it's, although it's uh, fallen short of unicorn status, it's uh, quite high. And again, these uh, all these cases all validate uh, the importance that fintechs are taking on the attention that they are um, capturing throughout the region. The next slide, before they give the floor to Pablo, I would like to, to talk about a few other operations which aren't just regional fintechs, Flex, Novo Carlos, and others. These are technological startups that are introducing financial services as part of, of as a part of their value proposal open banking, open finance technology, and a marketplace for the exchange of, and they're offering loans to customers, clients for secondhand car purchases, flat for real estate, lending, mortgage lending, Nuvo Cargo that operates in logistics and transportation between US and Mexico that has 
provided financial solutions to people who go up and down that corridor. Well, so what we see is that uh, any company with a technological solution or DNA can leverage uh, technology through infrastructure providers availing themselves of that regulation and providing financial services of their own to their clients. I thank you very much for the time you've given me to hear my presentation. Please, I prevail upon you to download that report for more details. And I give the floor now to Gonzalo. Thank you, Andres. Can you hear me? That uh, report is very worthwhile, very interesting. I'm quite impressed. Those of us in the uh, sector have been uh, staying abreast of this over the last five years, what's been happening in the fintech sector, and we feel quite encouraged by the fact that financial inclusion now is resulting from this and uh, the production that uh, results from this over the last uh, 15 months. Some investments have been made first in equity. That was our first uh, product and in capital investments. $10 million, Cubo Financiero in Mexico. And at the end of the year, a Brazilian startup was invested in, Ricarga Pay, whose financial offerings are growing quickly based on its payment platform with an excellent market dynamic uh, for payments in December. We stepped up our line of credit, Confio, for SMEs that are digitally based. We continue to invest in this sector. We see many opportunities through these new companies operating in the market, the larger market and uh, we're very encouraged to see ever more opportunities emerging in smaller markets as well. We seek out fintech uh, businesses that have surpassed the business model testing phase and are ready to scale up that need traditional equity investment. We are also trying to finance portfolios uh, that are of technologies. As Andres said, we see a lot of a potential here working with, uh, that is the different platforms. Given how much capital they handle and the strong engagement that we see through these platforms. And we're seeing opportunities to generate financing portfolios that are very sound and finance them through these different tools that we have uh, seen operating the different markets. So at IDB Invest, we stress our intention to be partners in the process of scaling up fintech. We expect to support business through financial products, but also through our knowledge and technical advice on governance so as to help ensure that businesses can grow more formally and attract new investors and grow to transform the region through better financial services. Thank you very much, then. I would like to give back the floor. Thank you, Andres, also for being our partner in the adventures of the fintech ecosystem, thanks to his team too, Elena and everyone else involved in putting the report together. This is a mutual adventure that has been very helpful to us all. And well, our colleagues at IDB Invest, Gonzalo, highlighted the fact that any uh, entrepreneurs or businesses can get in touch uh, with Gonzalo, thanks to our colleagues from IDB Invest who've been coordinating, and thanks to our IDB Lab, 
uh, colleagues as well who are a lab and incubator. And of course, there's an opportunity there for those who are only just starting out with their projects. And now we move on to something new we've included in this year's report, a map of fintech regulations, which we'll be sharing with you. So Jaime, could you please put up the map? The fintech regulation map is designed as a reference tool for information. It's simply for reference and information to offer an overview of regulations in terms of five um, fintech segments, crypto assets, open finance, fast retail payment systems, crowdfunding, and fi alternative finance in addition to trading and robo advisors. We've also got regulatory innovations across the region, innovation hubs and regulatory sandboxes. So what the map does is it shows the region's countries with official regulation issued by a regulatory or supervisory body in each jurisdiction. In the dark color, it means that there's a firm regulation put in place. In other words, a law, some regulation, a circular letter, some kind of formal registration system that is already underway or enacted. What we can also see in lighter hues is instances where there are plans through some uh, bill or draft, executive order resolutions, circular letter to implement regulation. And the white color refers to countries which haven't got any of the two situations described. We think this is mainly a uh, an overview tool so that regulators can navigate easily the regulations in other jurisdictions. And for investors, for those investing in fintech, it offers a clear picture of the regulatory landscape in the region. And for the ecosystem as a whole, this serves as a tool to know where regulation on fintech stands in the region. The document also contains a summary of the fintech regulations. And uh, thanks to Jaime Sarmiento, who helped me write a bit on crowdfunding. And thanks to Ana Maria, who helped me write the bits on the other verticals. And we will then be publishing a more extensive document on regulations in the region. A quick example of how our map works. Let's choose from the crowdfunding section. All you need to do is click on each of the boxes or regulatory innovations to see what the specific situation is. If you click on crowdfunding, you'll get on the right hand side a colored bar that will show by country in the darker colors, if you have regulation already implemented and in the lighter colors, whether there's a bill or draft resolution, circular letter, or some sort of administrative decision that will eventually lead to regulation. And white means the country has neither in place so far. That's essentially what the map shows on the right-hand side. And on the left hand side, you can see the map with the respective colors. In the middle, you can see for each country a description or the name of the act or resolution or administrative decision that provides the basis for regulation in each country. And on the left side, you can see the actual map with all of our region. We have this for 26 uh, jurisdictions 
across the region. If we click on Brazil on the map, if you double click Brazil, you'll get the regulations in effect in Brazil. For crowdfunding, we have regulation for equity crowdfunding. This is the resolution referred to there, CVM 588, dating back to 2017. This deals with equity. And for debt crowdfunding, you have resolution 4656 of 2018 issued by the Central Bank, which regulates uh, credit in Brazil. By clicking on the link on the right-hand side, you'll gain direct access to the respective regulation. This is a uh, tool that will change as we go. Our idea being to update every three months. We invite regulators to check this out. If there's anything you think is important and has not been included in the map, let us know. So I will include in the event chat the FinTech LAC email. Please do send us by email your opinions. If there's anything that should be included, please let us know. We will do so. And of course, this enables crowdsourcing. Uh, we'll crowdsource this tool with your opinions and inputs, whatever you think is relevant for inclusion purposes in the map. So you can see the links that Sahara has posted there. And again, this tool will prove highly useful for everyone. With that, we close the regulation chapter in our document. And Jaime, we now move on to the financial inclusion chapter. First, we should highlight gender. I would like to recognize the work done by Gabriel Andrade, who is on the bank's board today, playing a very significant role at the IDB. She was the one who first started with the gender analysis. I think this is of great value. And personally, this is one of my particular areas of interest. Since we see gaps which are being closed in terms of access to financial services for women in the region. Also, although we are bridging the gaps, the pandemic has imposed restrictions that have somehow slowed down and even stopped or reduced the progress we had seen previously across the region. Generally speaking, we are talking about some 93 billion on the business side, that is, in terms of the financing gap for women-led SMEs in the region. This is very important. Um, we will then hear through Tanya and Bob how these businesses have been uh, financed through fintechs. Of course, the share of women who've founded businesses has grown significantly in the region. We are looking at about 60% of women who are part of the initial operations of startups. And another important fact is that women are relatively more successful when it comes to securing the uh, funds for their projects, which is worth noting for a region. As financial consumers, and this is consistent with another analysis we did last year with Cambridge University, as financial consumers, women start to account for a significant share of use of fintech services 
for instance, alternative finance fintechs, we are looking at some 36% of businesses using fintech platforms for financing, which have a woman as manager or as the person requesting the funds. This is consistent with what we find here, and we see significant growth in the region. And from gender on to financial inclusion, two main highlights. First, in the region, fintechs self-identify as being for financial inclusion in 40% of the case, approximately. I actually believe it's much more than that, since the direct purpose might not be financial inclusion, but they end up giving access to people who formerly had no access or businesses that previously had no access. According to the survey we had in 2020, which Andres referred to, we are looking at some 42% of uh, loan uh, businesses that are serving uh, micro or small businesses that are underserved or not served by banks, which is also consistent with the analysis we did with Cambridge University. If we add unbanked SMEs and, uh, you know, fintechs that finance micro, small and medium-sized businesses that have no banking services or are underserved, we end up dealing with a significant share of fintechs that cater to the needs of this sector. And in our Cambridge report, we said that approximately 86% of, of $5.27 billion, 86% was micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. Fintechs in the region offer the potential of financing MSMEs as their function. And our work with Cambridge University is very important in terms of recognizing this fact, since we think that is an area that public policy should focus on as well. Some specific examples of things that have been going on in the region. First, on the payments front, and we'll also be discussing this tomorrow. We'll talk about PIX, the Brazil central bank system, which has 251 million accounts connected, 1.2 billion monthly transactions. And we always wondered where the problem with payments lay. And the thing is, the way uh, PIX payments are distributed 75 percent of the transactions in pigs are person to person transaction and therein lies the issue and therein lies the response and brazil at least has addressed this effectively another important point is that this also forces inclusion on the demand side but also from the supply side it's not just a closed uh, club uh, comprising banks it's a much broader much more open club grouping almost 700 different types of businesses engaged in PICS and offering services through PICS, which is essential. Out of those, approximately 30% are fintech platforms, of which 20% are direct loan businesses. These are crowdfunding platforms. But in Brazil, they can also perform payment services. This is a major result of public policies in Brazil. Another example we have in the region is Ascenso, a platform that has taken advantage of regulation in Colombia. It went public in Colombia and has been financing about 92 projects or nearly 7,000 people have invested. The figure is still very low, but it's an example of how, in addition to fintechs, traditional market infrastructure also has an opportunity by using financial technology. So the message is powerful. The fintech potential to address financial inclusion gaps in the region is very significant. And we want to show through data and figures that this is a case. The next one, and 
we will be wrapping up to give the floor to our next speakers. We will leave the Q and A um, dealing with both presentations for the very end. Thank you once again. Do download the publication and on the uh, regulation map. Remember, this is about crowdsourcing. So if you think there's some regulation that should be there and hasn't been included yet, let us know. We'll put it in there. And again, thanks to the team. With that, we move on to our next two speakers, Robert Wardrop, who's the director of the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance, and Tanya Ziegler, who's the lead researchers for alternative finance. And they will speak about two main issues. Why is it so very much important to develop alternative finance in the region? Because they end up financing MSMEs that are not otherwise financed by banks. This is what Tanya will talk about, and her presentation will focus on that message. But before that, Bob will tell us about what CCAF has been doing um, within the context of a partnership with Forge, which has given us a lot of satisfaction and good outcomes, um, including the publication coming out on Thursday, which will show the results of the research. Please, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Diego. I, I hope everyone can hear me. And it's really wonderful to be invited and to participate today because several speakers from IDB have referenced the, and the word I, I liked was fruitful collaboration in the region. We have global scope in what we do at the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance. But in terms of, um, of our, our engagement in the Latin, Latin American and Caribbean market, IDB has been a very deep collaborator since really we, we founded the center seven years ago. Um, I'm gonna talk today um, uh, a little bit about some of our learning. What are we doing in the center? What's our learning being with respect, particularly to engaging with, with um, supervisors? Where do we see some challenges and, and how are we addressing that? And I'm gonna focus today talking about one particular program that we announced recently, which is funded um, the, the foundational funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation called the Cambridge Subtech Lab. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, if you could move to the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about the lab, but first I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance so that everyone listening has a little bit of context for how the lab emerged and how it's seeking to address some challenges and issues that I think are highly relevant um, to the region. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think, uh, you know, the center's seven years old. I co-founded it with Brian Zhang back in 2015. Tanya, who will be speaking next, I think was the first person other than the two founders that worked in the center. And Tanya has been there as well for seven years. It's become a very large center in academic research terms. It's big. I mean, it has today well over 50 um, a staff of 50 on the payroll. And it probably has at least that number again. Um, in interns and fellows and, and people who are not directly on the payroll. Um, a very large research agenda I'll talk about in a minute. So you're looking probably at a universe of around 100 individuals involved with the center and its activities and a large and diverse group of funders uh, who we engage and collaborate with, yeah, including IDB. Uh, and its mission has really been quite consistent since it was founded, uh, which is really to try and understand new financial channels and instruments that emerge from outside of the traditional financial system. So when we talk about um, uh, crowdfunding, when we talk about crypto, crypto obviously an instrument, crowdfunding obviously a channel. We have been collecting empirical data on the development of these markets uh, with data going back to 2011, 2012. So, you know, well experienced in this space. Next slide, please. Now, the way we operate, we started and Tanya will be talking about the empir empirical research that we undertake, right? We don't do a lot of advocating. We don't do a lot of um, policy positioning work. We produce data uh, and the analysis of that data regarding business model changes really to inform stakeholders and others in decision-making and others who may in turn advocate 
we try and be very, very objective in what we do. And that original body of work, which continues today, that's what Tanya is involved in, um, led us into building our Cambridge FinTech and Regulatory Innovation Program, which is this pillar here um, that is delivering capacity building and education. We could see from the data we were collecting that there were significant knowledge gaps, particularly in the regulator community, the supervisor community, trying to understand what was emerging in business models, particularly in alternative finance channels, and how to respond with policy. Now, that activity, which now has globally had more than 1,400 regulators go through that program, including uh, you know, well over 100 from the region, um, led us to identify the need to actually create tools to provide to supervisors to help support their digital transformation. Um, because we talked about the need, I, to previous speakers talked about the need for regulation. Of course, policy frameworks are critically important. But the cadence of development of, of, of financial markets as a result of technology change, as a result of changes in the political economy, ESG, sustainability. So you've got technology change combined with pol political economy change is increasing the lag between regulatory response and those developments in the market. And so supporting the enablement of uh, regulators in their digital transformation is becoming an increasing focus of our work. Um, and then of course, each of these activities reinforce each other. Next slide, please. So if we take a look at the landscape of what we do, what we call our FinTech market observatory cluster, that's what Tanya's involved in and she'll talk more about that. Uh, we have a digital asset program. So the crypto activity that we'd be working with IDB later in the year is built into that cluster. We're very advanced in terms of, I think, um, probably the most cited in terms of energy use, a Bitcoin proof of work, for example, the Bitcoin electricity consumption index. We have a, a regulatory innovation hub cluster, a project called the Regulatory Genome Project, translating human readable regulatory content into a machine readable form to feed machine-based applications is quite core in that project. And what I'll spend a few minutes talking about today is the fourth cluster, which is the Subtech Lab. Next slide, please. So the Subtech Lab really grew out, again, as I said earlier, of our, our learning from our FinTech and regulatory innovation program on the needs regulators have to accelerate their own digital transformation. This is really what came out of COVID. That was a major COVID outcome, is this need to digitize in order to maintain the cadence and not open up that gap between regulatory innovation and supervisory capacity. Now, um, what we identified is, um, is that advanced technologies that are applied in this space we call subtech or supervisory technology, risk becoming or creating an inequality wedge between developed economies and, and less developed or developing economies with respect to regulatory organizations. If you talk to the Bank of England, or you talk to the FCA, or you talk to the Fed, or you talk to uh, the Baffin in Germany, MAS in Singapore, lots of resources, lots of access to technology, lots of access to the human resources that can deploy these technologies in supervisory functions. But in developing and emerging economies, that capacity just isn't there. And so we, we conceptualized this five program, five activity pillar program, which we call the Subtech Lab. Subtech intelligence, and I'll talk about each one of these in turn. A leadership program specifically designed for, for supervisors leading uh, subtech innovation within their organizations, facilitating digital transformation within their organizations. That's a different kind of leadership program than traditional leadership programs because it involves technology, it involves innovation. How do you deploy that? How do you engage people in an organization? How do you deal with procurement? How do you? So there's a lot of specifics about how you undertake leadership to achieve digital transformation, specifically in regulatory authorities, and then technical assistance to support the other pillars, and what we call an ecosystem accelerator. Previous speakers have commented on the importance of, of engaging the private sector 
with regulators. And that's important in the digital transformation of regulators as well. Next slide, please. Yeah, so first of all, subtech intelligence, broadly speaking, involves horizon scanning. There's a lot of learning out there. We've, we've picked this up in, again in our engagement with regulators that there's something happening in one part of the world that just isn't uh, being disseminated in another part of the world. So to be able to do a horizon scanning and, and understand um, sort of what globally subtech is being deployed and those use cases immensely valuable. Also very important is the third point here, this theory of harm of financial technologies. I think it was, I think it was Angel that mentioned the, 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 some of the, the risks of fraudulent behavior malfeasance that are emerging in digital finance. That's kind of the, the darker side of digital finance. And our view is, and Gates agrees with this, is that understanding consumer harms, emerging consumer harms is understudied. So part of what we're doing in sort of the intelligence analysis horizon scanning space is trying to understand how to build a, a, a theory of harm around financial technologies. And then of course, a subtech theory of, of intervention. Next slide, please. And so I mentioned the, the innovation leadership program, quite specific, we're building that program now. The same team that built FinTech and regulatory innovation is building this team. It launches in September 22. It's a long program. It's nine weeks and it's going to be five to six hours a week. Uh, it's going to be another hybrid program, the same way we run the CFTRI program. It's not inexpensive. However, there are scholarships available. To be specific, this whole program I'm describing today, Gates is actually funding its deployment in 15 jurisdictions and two regulatory authorities per jurisdiction and six supervisors per regulatory authority in each of those 16 jurisdictions across those five pillars. So there is funding available. Next slide, please. The third pillar is an application foundry building on some work that the two leaders of the Subtech Lab, um, Simone de Castries and, uh, and his partner, Matt, are doing with respect to some of the supervisory technologies that they actually deployed. For example, their chatbot project in the Philippines. So it's about how to engage and co-create applications with supervisors, central banks and supervisory authorities um, to help build and go through a, a disciplined process of agile prototyping and deployment, building actually on some of the tools that have already been created. Next pillar, please. I mentioned technical assistance. I, I wanna highlight that we're not thinking of technical assistance in the, what I would say the traditionally delivered manner of sending teams out to regulators or supervisory authorities. This is really about delivering technical assistance digitally. And the channel that will do that, we'll talk about in just a minute called the Regulatory Knowledge Exchange. But the idea here is also to introduce a subtech diagnostic toolkit. So in other words, a framework to actually assess current state of a supervisor with respect to its digital transformation and understand what that roadmap is to get to future state. So quite focused and also delivered digitally. Next slide, please. And I mentioned this ecosystem accelerator, and this is trying to identify a couple of different tools. One we call the Subtech Solutions Tracker. Again, what solutions are already out there that are relevant the subtech that can be deployed and how would one deploy those? And also um, a, a vendor database. Again, trying to involve and engage and create uh, better information uh, with respect to uh, vendors and deliver that through a regulator knowledge exchange, which is an online platform that we built with the support again of Gates funding that already has over a thousand regulators on it. It's a safe space for regulators to exchange information and gain access to training, tools, and other activity. Next slide, please. When you, when you assemble those, again, the build around the digital tools is a series of marketplace development tools, FinTech intelligence tools, and diagnostic tools. I won't go into these in detail now, but a, a body of these is already built. And with the, that code development through sprints and other activities would continue as part of the Subtech Lab activity with those jurisdictions participating. Next slide, please. 
and not directly part of the program, but related is another project I mentioned earlier, which is the Regulatory Genome Project on digitizing and essentially creating machine readable content translated from human readable documents. Uh, next slide, please. I think this will conclude. I'm, I'm sensitive on time. If you have questions and are interested in understanding how to engage with this, uh, of course, uh, we're happy to talk about that. And I think you'll hear a lot more about the lab and its developments going forward uh, in the coming months. And th thanks very much for your time. I'm going to pass back to Diego. Diego, I'm, I hope I'm tracking on time and didn't carve into too much of Tanya's time. It's okay. You, you, you're cutting off time uh, for Tanya. <laughs> So Tanya, um, before you you start, I, I just wanted to say that um, that um, again to our regulators and supervisors, uh, we are subsidizing half of the fees for the CFTRI program that Professor uh, Wardrop mentioned. It's it's important for those jurisdictions who who are in need of understanding fintech and understanding the technologies enabling fintech to take this class uh again more than open to 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 answer your questions you have the email uh, already put in our in our chat is fintechlack at iadb.org so now tanya uh no more no no more uh questions about uh any other thing that uh cambridge is doing we're going straight into our uh, document on SME access to digital finance and how fintechs are financing uh, SMEs all across the region. And the messages are very powerful. Thank you, Tanya, for being with us. Please go ahead and, and uh, I hope uh, we can make this um, uh, shortly in, in 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Diego, and the entire IDB and IDB Invest team for being such a wonderful partner to us over the last uh, coming on to seven years. Um, this project is the second uh, program that we've run with IDB that looked specifically at how small businesses are enabled by financial technology. When we first began this project three, four years ago, we looked at Chile and Mexico. And the results of that fight, the results from, from that report were staggering. It showed to us that for so many MSMEs and in particular micro uh, businesses, digital finance, digital lending in particular is not a last port of call, but a primary source for them in achieving their funding necessities. And so with that in mind, when we began to think about how to do this again, we decided to run a much larger panel. And we did so by creating a syndicate with 40 different financial technology platforms from across the region. And as you can see, these are platforms that are in the crowdfunding space, the real estate space, um, the lending space, the invoice trading space, particularly any kind of a firm that is enabling a borrower or a capital raiser or a fundraiser to access credit or, or finance that they otherwise would not be able to achieve. And so what you see here is that we've been able to pull together really one of the largest syndicates of, of platforms themselves who came together and partnered with us to collect. We actually collected over 680 responses um, to the actual survey. But when we going through data cleaning, we ended up with 540 firm level responses from across the region. And we saw, uh, you know, we, we did the study through a survey. We collected this data over a 10 week period in the first two quarters of 2021. And the data was collected in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. And I really have to emphasize that there's no way that this data would have been possible without all 40 of these financial technology platforms helping us going through their own social networks to assist us in getting these uh, end users, these MSMEs, to respond to this study. And as I said, this is the second study. And so what we wanted to really understand this time around was what were the key factors that were influencing MSMEs to choose a financial technology platform when accessing finance? What are the business owner's demographics? What is their company structure? 
what is quite crucially their relationship with traditional banks, in particular the retail and incumbent banking space, and how has this experience and, and future funding experiences been influenced by financial technology. And so with that in mind, we start to now deep dive into the kind of uh, respondent information that we received. So we did see a, a tremendous number of responses that came from Brazil, followed by Colombia, Mexico, Chile, Argentina, and Peru. We actually did have sort of negative 1% of responses that came from other parts of the region, but because that was out of scope in this project, they were not included within this sample. 76% of our respondents were utilizing a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. So some sort of a digital lending you know, facility for their primary fintech activity. This is then followed by 13% that were utilizing an invoice trading facility, 6% that took advantage of a non-investment crowdfunding, so a reward or a donation crowdfunding module, and 4% that utilized an investment vehicle such as an equity crowdfunding or real estate crowdfunding uh, platform. And so what we noted here is that there's this tremendous diversity of options, but we see that the majority of the MSMEs are in fact utilizing the lending space. We do note that most of these respondents are in fact men or identify as men, 70% 70, 70 of our panel. But it is worth noting that nearly 30%, so at 26, have actually noted that they were female-led, female-led entrepreneurship. And this is a, a, you know, a, a heartening number when compared to other sectors that we've looked at. When we think about the kinds of categories, the demographic of these businesses, what we tend to see is that most of these firms would be classified as micro-businesses or micro-MSMEs. Um, they tend to have, uh, you know, sort of up to five employees, um, although we do have a number of firms that responded that were, were bigger. With respect to their legal structure, we also noted that the majority of them would be categorized as either a sole partnership or a sole proprietorship, depending, of course, upon the legal definition within the given countries. Now, when you do read the report, which I hope you will read, you will see that we have some additional nuances on how we define and look at sole proprietors. And then with respect to the duration of trading, actually, these firms are relatively mature. We see that most of them have been operating for well over three years. We have around 30% that even go up to sort of, uh, sorry, 44% uh, that even go up to the, you know, six year mark. So these are not, you know, totally new firms. These are, these are businesses that have been around for a while. What we also wanted to think about was, you know, how are these firms using traditional finance? And so what we asked our respondents to think about was what their finance activities looked like before they went to their fintech of choice. And what we found, and this is not surprising, but it's important to have empirical data that actually can provide this as a, as a hard stat. Most firms are using traditional finance already, but there are substantial funding gaps that still exist. Most of these MSMEs are utilizing their personal credit accounts, their personal savings and checkings accounts. They are making use of banking products to transfer from their personal account into their business or utilizing personal credit cards often, very often in a weekly basis or certainly on a monthly basis. So we are seeing that many MSMEs, or at least the MSMEs from this panel, are certainly reliant upon their own self-financing to actually subsidize their business. But when we ask these platforms, okay, well, for the kind of finance that you were seeking, what options did you look at? What sources did you go to? What we really saw was, was quite shocking with respect to the bank space, the retail banking space. Nearly 80% of the entire data set had tried or you know, gone to a bank for the, for the funds that they needed. Only 45% of those were even offered any kind of, of facility. And of those 45, only 63 actually made use of that offer. And when you think about the reasons why they did not make use of that offer, that tiny number of firms that actually did, it's because 
typically terms were not amenable, drawdowns were insufficient, or the just terms and conditions from their bank were just not suitable for the kind of finance that they required. And so when we actually look, we had sort of less than 30% of firms that were able to access bank-based lending or bank-based credit pre previous to their financial technology journey. And so now when we think about the kind of funds, the kind of money that these firms needed, I think it's worth noting that when we conducted this study, this was at the peak of COVID. So this is, this is not just a study as we had intended where we were just looking at how businesses were using fintech. This ended up being a study about how MSMEs were using fintechs during COVID, which we know was a very difficult time in particular for the small business space. Now, when we kind of look at the different kinds of activity, the kinds of monies that these uh, businesses either raised or borrowed, we see that our, our median is actually fairly low, around the 4,000 mark, with an upper bound of 20K for that first three quartiles of our data. We do have some outliers that certainly borrowed or fundraised substantially more, even up to the tune of over a million in some cases. Um, so the average amount borrowed or raised does considerably go up when we look at it with our outliers, but with respect to just sort of the, the normal amounts that, um, that businesses were seeking, it tended to be sort of around that 4K mark. Now, certainly this is going to be influenced by the type of financial technology platform that you utilized. For firms that were using real estate crowdfunding, for example, it is not surprising to see that they were raising substantially more money because this is going to be related typically to the purchase of, you know, of, of, a, of, a, of a commercial asset. Um, you then see on the second half of this chart that you can sort of see that invoice trading is a little bit more, equity-based crowdfunding a little bit more, but the vast majority of this deficit did come from the peer-to-peer -peer lending space, and those borrowers were, let, were borrowing less. When we think about the rationale for why they were borrowing, we find that nearly 70% of this panel was using a finance, a fintech uh, for some sort of a working capital facility. We then have around 10% for asset purchase, another 10% for refinancing of existing debt, and another 10% for expansion capital. And then we had around 5% that it indicated some other use case. With respect to how these fintechs viewed the monies that they were receiving or, or, or borrowing through the platform, what we found was that most of these firms have noted that the facility is in fact affordable. And when we hone in specifically on the peer-to-peer -peer lending side, what we actually note is that most of these platforms are in fact well onto their road to repaying or have already paid off. And what we see is that there's very few instances where there have been problems. We do see that there are, you know, 57% are payments ongoing and they've never missed a payment. We see that around 15% have noted that they have paid off their loan. We do have examples where they've not been able to pay by due dates, but have been able to repay. But these values are much lower than perhaps what the general, um, what the general dialogues tend to think about, about affordability and about the kinds of MSMEs that are utilizing fintechs. These are fairly, uh, these, these are firms that are actually repaying. And with respect to how they view the affordability, we see actually that the loans, in particular peer-to-peer -peer lending loans, tend not to be predatory with respect to the interest rates that are being charged. And this is also important because again, general dialogues that we've had with incumbent banks, with uh, those maybe not as familiar with the fintech space, have this idea that peer-to-peer -peer lending can be quite predatory, but actually what we're seeing is that that is not the case. And so one of the things that we wanted to understand is not just, you know, how much and, and, at, the, and, and at the cost, um, we also wanted to understand why businesses were turning to financial technology platforms. And what we find is that for, a, for many of them, a key decision is really around the ability to receive funding quickly. So a very speedy drawdown. And then when you look at the top 
half of this chart, what you really see is that for so many of these businesses, this is around, you know, customer service, retaining control of their business, being able to have amenable and flexible terms that are appropriate to the kind of finance that they are receiving from their financial technology platform. And what you note here is that actually, by and large, these are the things that are driving businesses to turn to fintech. And when we ask them, how easy then was it for you to go through the onboarding process, the verification process, the EKYC process? What we actually see here is that for so many platforms, for so many businesses using these platforms, they are saying it's extremely easy or very easy. We found that for so like the vast majority of this panel, receiving the drawdown of the funds once they were approved was extremely easy. So that connectivity, that super, those fast rails, they are there in existence. The infrastructure is sufficient. And when we talk about just the EKYC and the onboarding component, what we really note here is that for so many, that, that digital interface is actually quite easy for them to use. So this is very important, especially within the context of COVID, when, when physical bank branches may not have been as feasible or a viable option in particular for those smaller MSMEs. And so when we think about what the impact then has been for these businesses, on, on average, what we've seen is that it's been a net positive impact for those platforms. And again, I'm honing in here on the peer-to-peer -peer lending side. Within our report, you're going to see this same breakdown for all of the different verticals that we reviewed for the purpose of our timings. I'm just going to focus on peer-to-peer -peer lending. Here we saw that after using their peer-to-peer -peer lending facility, so many of these platforms, almost 60% saying, actually, we were able to increase our turnover. We were able to increase our net income and profitability. When it came to employment, while most said that it was about the same, we do also see, you know, around a 20% increase in being able to add employees, especially again, during a time of COVID. And when we think about the impact to the businesses as a result of receiving this finance, we also see a majority of really positive outcomes that these firms have noted specifically related to their ability to use that peer-to-peer -peer lending facility, increased productivity, paying off existing loans, reducing costs, launching new products and services, expanding customer bases. Now, what's interesting, though, is that we also see a couple of negative uh, outcomes, and that's not to be ignored either, but this is something we note. When we look at the kind of um, the kind of subsequent funding that has then been achieved, 31% of our firms have actually said that they were in fact able to attract subsequent funding. And the majority of this was related to their bank, their primary banking relationship. And so this then brings us to think about the post-funding relationship that they have with that traditional space. And again, I'm focusing here on the peer-to-peer -peer lending side. Here, what we see is that actually, we have a little bit of a mixed bag. On the one hand, we note that businesses have now been able to make use of core business, I'm sorry, of core banking products more readily, opening a savings account, taking advantage of loan contracts, so on and so forth. But we also see a smaller reliance on things like overdrafts, on things like revolving lines of credit. So this is a mixed bag and something that we want to continue looking at. But by and large, what we have seen from the qualitative responses from our MSMEs is that actually their relationship with their traditional bank has been strengthened as a result of using the fintech facility. And last but certainly not least, COVID is something that we cannot ignore when we talk about resiliency of the MSME sector in 2021. It's an impossible thing to, 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 uh, to ignore. And what we found was actually so many of these businesses were more resilient. We found that only 3% of this panel had actually had to permanently close down their doors. 24% said, actually, we experienced no change to our operations. 27% temporarily shut down, but are now back in business. And 46% adjusted operations in order to continue their, their business.
And so what we see is that actually, although there's not tons of statistics available around what the overall um, experience has been for MSMEs in the countries that we've looked at, anecdotally, we've, we've seen that this is actually quite a bit better. We also can see how the fintechs themselves supported businesses throughout this process. 46% of our panel were able to make use of some sort of a payment deferment. 35 were able to, to take advantage of eased payment plans, so no interest for a period of time whilst they were repaying. So what we actually see here are that fintechs were very reactive to the needs of their customers, to the needs of their borrowers in particular. And this is, again, within the context of you know, other government schemes that were in existence. Now, what I really want to point to is this additional credit facility not related to government assistance schemes. One of the things that has been notable is that so many financial technology platforms themselves were unable to function as a distribution partner for governments, and yet they still provided substantive assistance to their end, to their end client. So I think that brings me to the top of my time. Thank you so much for your attention, um, and I hand the virtual mic back over to Diego. No, Tanya, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that uh, that uh, the presentation was interesting for the supervisors, but most of all to the uh, policymakers in the region. One of the key messages of, of the fintech platforms financing MSMEs and those MSMEs having in 92% of their responses, maintaining and or even increasing uh, the number of employees is a strong message, even if we don't have a control group uh, to assess the differences. This is powerful. Same thing with the turnover. Uh, the turnover we're talking about, some around 80% of the MSMEs that receive financing from fintechs said that maintained and or increased uh, their turnover. This is powerful. It's a powerful message for our policymakers because FinTech is showing that it is an alternative for solving part of the issues of nearly 30% of our regional GDP gap in financing MSMEs. Very, very important message, Tanya. Thank you very much. This is super powerful, ultra powerful, I would say. So, so thank you. Now we're gonna go uh, with questions. We, we don't have much time. Uh, so what we're gonna do is I'm going to ask one question to Andres. I don't know if Gonzalo is still connected, but, uh, but one question for Andres, one question for Bob and one question for Tania, all right? Um, so, so, so for Andres, uh, I will turn uh, to Spanish now. Andres, eh, desde el punto de vista... From the standpoint, Andres, of our study, I have two questions for you. The first thing, what explains the emerging, the growth of the emerging models as insure tech or open finance in our region? That is the first question. What explains that growth of these emerging models? That's the first question. And the second question, what are the most disruptive models in Fontech uh, in our region? What comes to mind when people ask you what the most disruptive FinTech model there is in the region? From the standpoint of your Finovista, which is an incubator for startups in the region. So, Andres, thank you. I'm going to start by answering the second question first. I don't want to focus or zero in on any fintech in uh, particular, but there are two concepts that come to mind. One, when we speak of being disruptive or disruption, the first thing that comes to mind is crypto. 
not crypto as an asset, but uh, given the technology that undergirds it, blockchain, which is a technological platform, and you also have to see crypto as an asset that can truly disrupt finance, just as, uh, or as we see it today, as we know it. The second thing, as far as uh, disruptive technologies, this isn't a technological disruption, it's more conceptual, which is uh, this concept that I think we are reaching a turning point in the region in which any company can be a fintech. Anyone can be a fintech. And uh, we've seen some examples of this in Latin America. Mercado Libre, both are companies that, that were born of technological DNA based on open finance that to connect via API and avail themselves of infrastructure that exists and tech plugins for payroll, buy now, pay later, lending to their client base. Although it's not really disruptive from the technological standpoint, I do think it's been disruptive. We think that these are millions of consumers that are reached by these platforms and they offer financial services in a very impactful way. These are two concepts that I would say are very disruptive in the region. What are, what explains these emerging models? That's a bit more complex. Each emerging sector insurance, for example, is what I would underscore the clearest ex explanation for me has to do with the fact that this is a industry that's fallen behind the transformation. It's digital transformation and the entrepreneur, even if this is a common denominator in all of the uh, emerging sectors, talent the entrepreneur sees this opportunity and is uh, seeing that it now can be backed by the necessary capital to take this, uh, to take an idea, to start up a new business, to validate it, and then to actually start that business. Each segment would have its own explanation, uh, different opportunities that they are each uh, availing themselves of. I think the message is truly powerful and clear, and the decisions we've made regarding the way forward are really good. We all agree, I think, that crypto and open finance is the next big thing, which is already underway in the region, and we have amazingly identified over 90 crypto platforms as part of the study we're doing along with Cambridge University. It is indeed a huge ecosystem, which I think we all need to focus on. And also open finance. We've been working a lot on that and have also found fewer platforms, but very impactful ones. And that's some of what we'll be addressing tomorrow. I will now speak English. I would like to start with uh, Robert. Wardrop. They have a, a question here, which I think that it's uh, it's of your heart, actually, and it is uh, about subtech. So what could hinder the development of subtech in Latin America and the Caribbean? And what could be done to develop subtech in Latin America and the Caribbean? Please go ahead. So I'm going to I'm going to answer with because of partly time, but because I, I would like to give uh, an idea that you could actually implement in the next 100 days, like super practical. I think it I think the idea of of standalone building and creating things in subtech within an individual kind of supervisory authority is just it's not going to work. 
I don't think the expertise is there. I think um, time, just time to realizing budgets, many things, which means you, you really have to figure out how you're going to integrate um, solutions from vendors. And the challenge in supervisory authority, central banks, um, is procurement typically has a history of acquiring kind of what I would describe as a large and complex infrastructure, which has a very onerous, robust, but onerous procurement process. And I, I think the thing you could do in the next hundred days to kind of reduce some friction in terms of subtech implementation is sit down with the procurement teams in your organization and, and kind of redefine what the thresholds and procurement process should be for procuring third-party subtech solutions. Because if you don't do that, you're going to have a very long procurement process. You're going to, you're going to anything you put out for, for a call for an RFP, an RFQ, you're going to get very low response rates. Because you know, when you think about subtech vendors, many of them are small, many of them are agile, and they the 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 threshold uh, criteria set that you would use in your traditional procurement, I would argue, not much of is it is uh, ex, is is it is much more than you need to procure for subtech. So aside from kind of culture issues, I think the procurement process itself, changing the culture of procurement, and and the, and the, the approach procurement has to to implementing acquiring subtech solutions is a very practical step you could take to make a difference within your organizations. Uh, yeah, no, I completely agree, uh, Professor Wardrop. And, and part of what we are doing is precisely about this. Uh, it's, as we mentioned before, is the creation of institutional capacity so people can embrace technology within the regulators and supervisors and apply it to their supervisory uh, processes essentially. That's that's what we're doing, and, and part of what you are doing uh, precisely uh, gets together very well, pairs very well what we, we, we are doing from fintech. Like so, so thank you for the answer. And now, uh, obviously, uh, Tanya, um, we 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 have a, a question for you. Uh, let me uh, review it. Um, do you have um, from your perspective? We, we, we talked about the effects of fintech financing on MSMEs, right? And how without a control group, again, they increased or maintained their turnover in the middle of the pandemic, increased or maintained the number of employees. In fact, I was looking at the statistics again, 31% of the respondents said that they increased the number of employees in the middle of the pandemic. So from your perspective, would you have any type of conclusion that would be useful for the policymakers attending this meeting today in those terms? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that having an SME access to finance mandate is quite crucial. And that mandate needs to include a discussion of financial technology. That mandate needs to include in particular digital lending, it should include certainly the crowdfunding space. This study did not include it, but we are increasingly looking at payments and, and the uh, infrastructure. So what Andres was noting about embedded finance, um, you know, as payments become a bigger component of, of, the, of the fintech ecosystem, certainly in Latin America, and the predominant use case is merchants, that has to be a component of the discussion. We're doing a, a study, a very similar study at the moment um, with the Asian Development Bank Institute, looking at how ASEAN MSMEs are, are utilizing FinTech. The conclusions are virtually the same. So I think for a regulator, we have to move beyond the discussion. And this is my opinion, not the opinion of the university, um, but we have to move beyond the discussion of can FinTech have a impact to what is the impact and how do we facilitate innovation whilst also maintaining you know, a balance um, and, and preventing any unnecessary risk. I think more empirical research showing this very types of, of data that you saw today. Now this is a smaller data set. This is around 600 MSMEs. 
The ASEAN data set includes nearly 10,000, but the findings are quite comparable. So with respect to just finding out, you know, really what is the true impact, I would say regulators should perhaps invest a bit more on, on, on focusing on what that empirical data looks like and then supporting financial technology innovation within an SME access to finance mandate. Yeah, th thank you very much, Tanya. We were, we were pretty much uh, aligned uh, on our thoughts uh, on that respect. And, um, and precisely what we are doing with, with the study that we will launch next, next Thursday, it's about it precisely showing the data, showing the numbers uh, for regulators and supervisors to understand, but also for the rest of the ecosystem to see that what is happening, although it's still in a very small scale compared to the rest of the financial system, is of significance. It's important, it's relevant, and um, it's paving the way uh, to solve partially some of the issues in terms of financial inclusion gaps that we have across the region. But I completely agree with you, uh, Tanya. And uh, by the way, uh, the study is going to be uh, also uploaded in a link in our publications link. If you are in Zoom, you can see the link. It says link publicaciones CMF. It's a link that Sahara just uh, posted there in our chat. Uh, that link contains all of our publications on fintech, but also uh, we will we will uh, send an email to all the people attending today uh, that contains the link to our uh, keynote, uh, our flagship document that we developed together with uh, with Finnovista. Uh, this link also and uh, and the link. Uh, containing all the information about the event. So uh, I would like to say thank you, Andres, Tania, uh, Professor Wardrop. This was this was fantastic. I think we have a journey of learning. It was too much information, uh, but I guess that uh, it was useful for all the attendants today. I, I want to thank again the team um, uh, and uh, and you guys uh, for the partnership in Cambridge and Finnovista because I think we are doing things that are important for the fintech ecosystem in our region. Uh, so to that uh, extent, we would like to invite you over uh, to use the hashtag uh, fintechlac2022 uh, for our social networks. We leave you with our social networks too. And Jaime is going to show you what's going to happen uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much to our presenters today. Tomorrow we have a very, very interesting um, keynote speaker on PICS. Payments are relevant for, for the financial system. We will have PICS as an example of how to enable fintechs to work uh, in an open finance um, ecosystem uh, led by a central bank. Uh, the debate will be also, I mean, the conversation is going to be led by Hema Sacristan, who is the CIO from IDB Invest. Uh, very relevant uh, to be there tomorrow for this first uh, keynote speaker. And then we will have a panel led by Bruno Dinis from, from FData. And we will have a regulator uh, represented by Daniel Daniel Calvo from CMF from Chile, who are on the verge of implementing open finance. Uh, Rodrigo Tumayan from Prometeo Open Banking, uh, one of the largest open finance uh, platforms in our region. And Mauricio Tovar from Tropicus, a DeFi decentralized finance uh, platform from our region. They will talk about DeFi and open finance and how everything is changing in the financial ecosystem in the region. For tomorrow, we will not have YouTube uh, and we will not have LinkedIn. So we invite you over to register for the Zoom link. Uh, Sahara is going to share with you uh, also the, um, the surveys for today. Please click on the surveys for English and Spanish. If you have any comments, if these presentations were useful, uh, if, uh, if, if you liked what you saw today, 
uh, and the information was useful, please let us know. If you think that something else missing, uh, uh, please let us know too. Uh, the surveys are very important for us. Our role is to improve what we do. Uh, and um, my team is very compromised with improving everything. Uh, and also, uh, Sahara, if you can share again, the registration link for FinTech Lag. For tomorrow, we will only have the Zoom. Um, uh, so please register. If you haven't registered yet, please uh, take a look at, at our LinkedIn, FinTech Lag. FinTech LAC, FinTech LAC is our, uh, our LinkedIn uh, and our Twitter is also FinTech LAC, at FinTech LAC, very easy to, to, to reach. Please, um, we have the, the links there too for the people who are watching us through LinkedIn uh, and YouTube. Uh, and please connect with us tomorrow through Zoom. Uh, we are eager to tell you more about the FinTech ecosystem. We are very happy to share all this knowledge uh, for the regulators and supervisors. Again, please join us for the uh, FinTech Lack Assembly on Thursday. If you haven't registered or you don't have the information, please write to us uh, via uh, email. Our email is fintechlack at iadb.org as uh, Sahara has shared many times in the chat. Uh, uh, and I'd like to thank also our attendance. Today we went over 1,400 people uh, connected to our event. This is a successful event. Thank you very much uh, to our communications team, Romina, uh, but especially Lady M, Mildred Rivera. Thank you very much for, for the communications. Uh, I think that we were very successful communicating what we are doing. Uh, and to that extent, thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow again, 9.30 a.m. through Zoom. Please register if you haven't registered yet. The link is, is, is the same link for today, tomorrow, and Thursday uh, for public attendance. And there's a special link for the assembly only sent to uh, our regulators, supervisors, and fintech associations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please download our study. It's a very important uh, compilation of information of what's happening in the fintech ecosystem of our region. Please download it uh, in, in our link. It's www.iadb.org slash fintech2022. Uh, Sahara just uh, posted uh, the links here for the Zoom attendance. And uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you again. Thank you very much to everyone. Uh, have a good day.